Um, about half of you, your universities are members of the Charter. I think it's 51 per cent. That might not be half in this room. So that means that about half of you, on average, should know what I'm talking about. But of course, <laughs> at your level, it might not be something you spend every day thinking about. Um, I was involved very much with setting up the Athena project, which was towards the end of the 90s. Um, and I chair, in fact, I chaired it for about the first five years. And Athena Swan came out of the Athena project. So I just want to give you a little bit of background about what the Athena project was. It arose from the observation that there were relatively few academics in science departments, and I use science in the most general sense, please, science, engineering, medicine, and moreover, there was an extremely leaky pipeline. So if you looked at something like chemistry, for example, about half the undergraduates were women. There was, in the 90s, probably one or two professors, never mind head of department, professors who were women in chemistry departments. So there was an enormous wastage, apparently, of people going into academic careers. And out of that sprang the idea of the Athena project. It was given an enormous boost by the then uh, chair of HEFSI, Brian Fender, who gave a large grant, what appeared to us attempting to run the Athena project a large grant. Um, from his point of view, I don't think it was very large if you took the whole budget of the universities. But the consequence was we were able to distribute that money in small aliquots across the university system. And he pointed out to us subsequently that wasn't something HEFSI would have been able to do. What we actually did was give, first of all, give grant, pr grants to people who had proposals to do something in their department or institution that would help the progress, the uh, attainment of a level, level playing field, etc. And they were quite small grants. When those grants reported back, they were all written up in reports, and most of these reports are available on the Athena website, and there's an enormous amount about good practice in them. Subsequent to the grants, we also gave um, project awards. We gave awards for good practice. So it was the beginning of the thinking that if people were doing good things, you wanted to reward them for it, give them some money to carry on, but also to publicize it. And one way to publicize it was to give awards. And I remember being in this room where we gave some of the awards with a rare vice chancellor sitting beside me, including Eric Sykes, who was then vice chancellor of Imperial College. And we involved people at the most senior level to look at the Athena projects and to be aware of them. Out of the Athena project, one of the ideas that grew was the idea of the Swan Charter. The word Swan has nice implications when you think about women in science, but actually the initial acronym doesn't really um, bear um, examination today because it's Scientific Women's Academic Network. But it grew out of a Scientific Women's Academic Network of London universities. And the idea of a charter that universities could sign up to grew out of the conference in about 2002, 2003. Um, there were 10 founding members, and that all happened in about 2005. The first awards were given in 2006. And the idea of how the wards were structured has changed over a period of time. And I'm not going to describe them in detail. Sarah's here. She can tell you how the awards are structured. Originally, the idea was silver and gold. Um, more recently, it was clear you needed something more of a beginner's award, and bronze came into the act. There is, to date, only one gold award to the chemistry department in York and the head of that department has spent a lot of time going around talking to people about what he's done, what he's achieved and what has actually been the huge benefits to his department of all the activities that they have. Um, in 2011, by which stage the SWAN awards were housed at ECU and were being largely funded by ECU and funds that ECU brought in to do so, it was thought that a, um, a survey of what was going on would be useful, and I think a number of you will have picked this up when you came in. In turn, I was asked by Nicola if I could touch on the business case. The business case is largely to do with being able to recruit and retain excellent women academics. 
And if you think <coughs> of the cost of a recruitment exercise and the loss of losing somebody because they move somewhere else, you can see there's a strong business case in there. A number of the universities that were surveyed have comments in here about how holding the awards helped departments in that aspect. But the other thing is, in general, what um, a SWAN award requires a department or university to do is look at their own practices, see what they are doing and what they might do better, to write it down and have it looked at by somebody else. And that's quite helpful. A lot of the departments that are surveyed in here say that it really helped them to see what they were doing, what they could improve, and the point they all make is it doesn't just improve things for women academics, it improves things for everybody in the department. I remember back in the early days in the 90s, uh, a senior meeting in Imperial College, um, and one of my colleagues, John Perkins in fact, who will be known to one or two of you, um, remarked after we talked about this how strongly he was in favour of what we were doing in the college because anything that made a department or a college more female friendly was also going to make it Perkins friendly and I've always remembered that as a phrase but it is true good practice affects everybody in a department it turns out and there's plenty of surveys that show this that bad pra practice unequally seems to affect the women in the department it has a much stronger effect on the women and therefore focusing on what can help the women in their career aspirations in maintaining their careers and in developing their careers will help everybody in a department. Um, we have at the moment, as I say, the Swan Awards are housed at ECU and now ECU has the funding in place for the next few years, not just from ECU funds but from a broader aspect of funds and David Ruban at the back can tell you where they're coming from if you, anybody's interested. Um, there has been steady progress across the sector to people joining in and wanting their department or their university to win an award. I think the idea of the award very cleverly um, calls to the academic competitive instinct. And I note that once some of the big physics departments, for example, started to obtain SWAN awards, several of the others came along and said, well, why can't we have a SWAN award? It's not a trivial thing to obtain. I have been closely involved in my own department at Imperial College, seeing what has to be done. There's a great deal of data gathering, and in many places that data were Work, those data were not available. And then there's a question of thinking concretely about what you might do to improve things. Some of the things that people improve are so simple, they appear trivial. Um, but when you actually look at them, they make a big difference to people's lives. One of them, in one university, was simply not holding departmental meetings at 5.30 or 6 in the evening, where the women, if they had any children, usually had to go and deal with childcare. Having the meetings during a reasonable working day changed the aspect and meant people were able to attend. So there are very simple things, but of course a lot is to do with a culture and thinking it through. Um, there are now, as far as I know, 68 university members of the Charter. Actually, I should say not just universities, but research and institutes embedded in universities are eligible for becoming Charter members. What the Charter members do is to sign up to the six Charter principles, and I won't read them out. They're, I think they're probably in the leaflet that you are all send, and they're certainly in the front of this book. There are 87 award-holding universities. Um, now, that me doesn't mean 87 departments. There are rather more departments than 87, I think. Within the university? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we have 87 award-holding universities and departments, and I think there's about 35 bronze university awards and then the rest of the awards spread out through them. And as I say, there is as yet only one gold award and I know several places that are working very hard because they want to be the next gold award. Um, I was, as I say, I was asked by Nicola to touch on the business case and I think the business case rests in the, the question of maintaining good practice in departments, recruiting good staff and developing their careers. And a lot of the comments in this survey focus on those sorts of aspects. 
anecdotally, and it's always anecdotally, I am aware of senior women academics who are looking to move to other universities because they're deeply unhappy in their own departments and they are looking for university departments which hold SWAN awards and universities where SWAN awards are seen to be important. And I'm not, I obviously can't give you names, but I have met women who are telling me that. Now, if you then are going to lose a senior woman in your department in whom you have invested a lot of time and effort, first of all recruiting her, and then in giving her lab space, etc., that's, to me, an important part of the business case. But having a department that runs efficiently, r runs smoothly, depends on having people who buy into it. We're all aware that, as somebody once said to our rector years ago, you may ask me to do things, I may do them. Now, academics do actually respond to requests from on high, but there's still a considerable amount of freedom with the, uh, the, in the alacrity with which academics respond to the leadership from the top. And a department that's running well with good leadership will respond to those activities in the university in a much better way. So in my view, this is about good practice as regards women, but it's about good practice as regards university departments. Okay, so everything was progressing organically. That is to say, departments by word of mouth or because there was a champion in the university would look at Athena Swan and decide that they would like to get involved. They would inquire, they would find out what was necessary and then apply to become bronze or silver award holders. And this was going on quite satisfactorily in a, as I say, a steady increasing sense. And then Sally Davis sent out her letter to medical schools. And I have to say, and I will emphasize this enormously, nobody was more surprised than Athena Swan. We had no idea she was going to do this. There had been no discussions with her beforehand. We are, of course, absolutely delighted that she sees Athena Swan as an indicator of good practice and something that's worth focusing on. But it has led to quite a lot of hard work in thinking about how one would deliver what she's asking for. And I'm going to ask Sarah to take over now because I have not been involved in these discussions, but I know there have been discussions between Sarah and others at the ECU and the Department of Health and how you might actually interpret and then deliver against Sally Powers' request to the... Sally Davis, I'm sorry, I didn't quite work keep saying that, Sally Davis' request to the medical schools. And if Sarah then tells you about that, then we have time, I think, after that for questions from the floor, if that's yes. okay. So can I pass over to Sarah to tell you a bit about what's happened since that letter, since I think a number of you are quite interested. Can I just remark one thing? One of the impressions one gets coming back is that medical schools are deeply worried by this, but I happen to be sitting next to somebody from Oxford Medical School at a dinner two days ago who said, oh, no, all we've done is ask one of our most senior female academics, an FRS, to start championing, championing what we ought to do. And it seemed to me that was a positive reaction to the letter rather than a negative one. Sarah. Um, yeah, I mean, picking up from that, um, so when the letter landed on... In fact, the letter didn't even land on my desk. I had a phone call from somebody else saying the letter landed on their desk. Um, it was very big news for us. And... Um, since then, my phone has been ringing almost every day with somebody from medical schools with queries, but actually nothing bad. I haven't had any negativity from any medical schools that have, that have contacted me. Actually, the opposite. Um, I've had quality and diversity practitioners saying that they don't have to go to any of their departments asking or promoting SWAN. They're coming to them now wanting to know what it is and how to move it forward. So we may have gone a little bit quiet on the medical school front in terms of our next steps and what we're doing, and that's largely because it's all happening behind the scenes and we want to get it uh, organised before we make any necessary announcements. But we have met with the Department of Health and um, the NHS research contact within that to iron out what it is that they would like to see um, come the next round of NIHR funding for biomedical research centres and units. And we are devising a program in conjunction with them to make sure that, that we can support medical schools thoroughly um, with embarking on the process. Um, we are looking at increasing the resource for Athena Swan generally. So um, another member of staff 
and from the new year we'll be looking at rolling out a programme specifically for medical schools that will run alongside our regular activities with the rest of the set uh, definition that we have which is incredibly broad. So we're going to be setting up a medical school advisory group which will draw on uh, representatives from the Medical Schools Council. Um, hopefully somebody from the Department of Health will be able to sit on that also. Um, people from our steering committee from Athena Swan who are in medical schools themselves. We also have um, a number of department award holders that are from departments in medical schools already. So we are going to be dragging them onto the advisory group and picking their brains for actually what's been working with them already. Um, and from that, we hope to um, produce some more detailed guidance on examples of good practice that would work in medical schools, particularly with the clinical, non-clinical divide and spending some of the time within the NHS as well within academia. Um, but also holding specific workshops, looking at sort of what the charter is and what it is that we look for through the awards process. Um, hopefully being able to hold a series of these events over the course of the next couple of years to pick people up to speed on that. Um, we have had some applications, uh, the application round has just closed for this, this round sort of yesterday, today. Um, and we've had some applications from medical schools already and some from other medical school departments. People are picking it up. But we're working with medical school schools to, to say that, you know, yes, Sally Davis has said silver, but for Swan, you can start with the bronze department, work up to silver based on the feedback that you would get from the panels. It's all about, we, we don't sort of shout you down and say you're really not doing very well. It's all about what more that you could be doing. We'll give you advice. We'll say some of the things that might work in your instance, given the data that you would give us. So we're absolutely not going to just leave you on your own to work out the process and what it means and how it works. Um, we have been working the programme for medical schools across the whole of the UK, aware that the NIHR funding is only eligible for universities in England, um, but actually it's prompted new membership from universities from all over the UK that hold medical schools. We've seen a huge increase from Scotland in the last few months. Um, wanting to also be able to compete on that level, to be attractive for female staff. If one medical school is starting to put something in place that's going to attract more women, the rest don't really want to get left behind just because they don't have that sort of funding prod, shall we say. Um, but actually, a lot of the medical schools are already in institutions that are part of SWAN, that hold awards, and that have a number of departments holding awards. And we strongly encourage any of the departments that are part of SWAN holding awards to be sharing their experience. That's all part of the process, and I'm sure many of them don't appreciate that I generally point that anybody that comes to me in quest with questions in the direction of another department that's been doing something very well or in the area or who you could talk to. So there will be a network of champions already within your institutions that hold awards that you can go and speak to, that, that there's already a lot of knowledge of what works and what doesn't work when it comes to um, increasing the representation of women. And we'll be drawing on that further. We're at the moment setting up regional networks of institutions so that they can start meeting more locally um, alongside the programme that we run on the national scale as well. We're launching a new website in the new year which will be much more accessible and provide more detailed information for medical schools. So there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline that's going to be coming out. It just hasn't launched yet, but it will be there from the new year.